In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today does come from the book of Samuel, and we'll be discussing that going along with our series on Samuel. Now, if you haven't caught the previous Chaplain's Report that deals with this, just so you know where we are, so you're kind of caught up. Saul is, at this point, has already gone forth to the Amalekites, and God commanded him to, to wipe them out. Every single person, destroy the entire civilization, don't take spoil of them, destroy the livestock, destroy everyone. Basically, there should be no way that anybody would even know that the Amalekites existed once you were done with this. That was God's command. And what Saul does is, he doesn't do it. He does most of it, but he decides to save some of the the stuff, save some of the spoil, save some of the livestock, and, and also, let's not kill King Agag. Let's just keep him alive. Everybody else is dead, but we'll just kind of keep him with us. So as you can imagine, obviously disobeying a direct command from God, God has not been very pleased with him, and we've already seen where Samuel starts to chastise him a little bit. Uh, let's go ahead and see Samuel's response here in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 17 through 19, where he says, Samuel said, Is it not true, though you were little in your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed you king over Israel? And the Lord sent you on a mission, and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are exterminated. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil, and did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord? These are good questions. Basically, Saul just, or sorry, Samuel just tells it like it is and says, Saul, God has already done quite a bit for you. And remember, he's speaking directly for God. This is a message directly from God. So this isn't just Samuel adding his own commentary. And what God says to Saul there is, look at everything that I've done for you. Even though you were not somebody of renown, even though you weren't somebody that was, you know, in line to be king or anything like that, I took you from nothing and I made you king and I put you in charge of my people. Why are you disobeying me, Saul? This is a very, very serious question and it speaks to situations that we are here with today because I think one thing this actually does Ill illustrate, even though it's not the most obvious lesson, is stewardship. Because what do we see here? We see that God is asking basically, Saul, I've done all these things for you. Why aren't you listening to me? That is a lesson in and of itself, and that is certainly a correct way to look at this story. I think that it's one that merits a second look, and, and I think that God can say the same thing to us in a lot of ways. If he were to say, Caleb, Caleb, look, I've given you uh, a radio show. I've given you an audience that likes to listen to you. I've given you the ability to, to read all these books and to live in a land of prosperity where you can do all of this. Why are you using this medium in a way that would not please me? Like, if God were to have that conversation with me, and I know he doesn't speak to people through prophets like he did back then, but that would be similar to what Saul is going through right now. That Saul has been given this amazing blessing of being Israel's king to lead the tribes of Israel, to be a leader to, to Israel's people, to lead them toward doing what God commands them to do. And Saul does the exact opposite. And so that in and of itself is a powerful message. But it also shows that God expects things from us when he blesses us. There's a fantastic line, one of my favorite movie lines of all time, and I think this movie is frankly severely underrated. It has Sean Connery as King Arthur and, and Richard Gere as Lancelot. Uh, there's a great line where Sean Connery, playing King Arthur, says, God makes us powerful only for a little while so that we can help one another. See, that's a concept that Saul doesn't get here. Unfortunately, 
Saul had forgotten that with the blessing of being the king, with the blessing of, of being the leader of God's people, that came with responsibility. That came coupled with the obligation to do things that God would want him to do. And to a degree, God gives this to everybody. No, he doesn't make all of his kings, obviously. But, like, we're given the responsibility as Christians to go out and seek and save the lost, part of the Great Commission. Well, that is part of the privilege of being one of God's chosen elect. That we have to go out and, and to try to save others and to preach the gospel of Christ to other people. That's part of that privilege. Yes, we get the benefits of being part of the body of Christ, but it comes with the expectation that we will use that privilege to seek out others to join God's family. And that's what is happening to Saul here is God saying, look, Saul, I, I gave you this amazing blessing. Why aren't you using it to lead Israel the way I told you to? And when we neglect, neglect a responsibility just like Saul did, sometimes that blessing is removed. Now, this is getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. But we see that later on, because of his sin here and in other places where he does essentially the same thing and disobeys God, that that blessing is eventually taken away from him and given to another, given to King David. And that was because Saul neglected his responsibility, ergo, the blessing that, was, that came with that responsibility is taken away from him. It's the same thing that we see in Jesus' parable of the talents. You remember the last guy at the end that didn't go out and make gain and just had that same talent at the end? What happened? His blessing was taken away, and that blessing was given to somebody who was going to make use of that talent. And so this is what's happening here in real time, is that Saul disobeys, he does something wrong, he, uh, he goes against what God told him to do, and God says, okay, that, res that expectation of what you were going to do with that blessing has not been fulfilled by you, ergo, I will remove that blessing from you, give it to somebody who will use it more wisely. And so when we neglect to do that which God has commanded us to do, especially when he's given us some kind of specific blessing that correlates with that, we can't be surprised when the, the blessing goes if we refuse to fulfill our obligation to God. And this is a little bit further illustrated in the second verse that I want to share with you in 1 Samuel 15, verses 20 through 21. This is Saul's response here. Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord and went on the mission which the Lord sent me and have brought back Agag, the king of the Amalekite, uh, uh, the king of Am Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took some of the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, the choicest of the things devoted to destruction to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. Now, this is the second time that Saul brings this up, that, oh, well, we brought back the stuff to sacrifice to God. So he's trying to hedge his bets here. He's trying to say, well, yeah, we, we took some of the spoils, but we were doing it for God. And we'll get into that a little bit in our next installment where we talk about obedience. But notice Saul's pattern here. He starts with denial, and then he moves to blame. Starts with denial, then moves to blame. This is unfortunately a very human pattern to fall into. We see it with sins over and over and over again in the Bible. He starts out with, oh, no, no, I, I did obey the commandment of the Lord. I absolutely obeyed the commandment of the Lord. I just, you know, I did utterly destroy them. I mean, like, mostly utterly destroyed them. I, I still have Agag, and we kept some of the, the sheep and the oxen, but, you know, I did, like, mostly do what God told me to do. So, yeah, I'd say I fulfilled the commandment. Okay, well, did you do it or did you not do it? Because that's really the only two options here. You either obeyed God or you didn't obey God. And this is clearly a case of you not obeying God. Which, by the way, I think is a warning as well. If we have to work too hard to justify our action to God, probably not a great idea. That's probably an occasion where we need to slow our roll a little bit. And, and do some self-evaluation as to whether we're not on the, the right track. Maybe we are, but if you got to work that hard, if you have to come up with this big, long explanation that Samuel issues here, 
to explain how, no, I actually did obey God. Maybe he's right, but in this case, you can clearly see, no, not so much. He's clearly in violation of what God had told him to do. And that in and of itself, because the thing is, Saul knew. Saul knew that he had messed up. Saul knew that he had disobeyed God. You can tell that by his reaction. You can tell it by the verses earlier where he tries to weasel his way out of it and hide the fact that there were animals there and hide the fact that King Agag was there. And he does own up to it eventually after he's caught, which, you know, that's a big testament to his character. But then after he does own up to it, he owns up to it in a sense, but then also kind of tries to justify it and say, no, no, but I really did obey God's commandments. And then he moves to blame. But these people, you know, the, the people with me, the people that are given to my charge, they spoiled and, and took some of the things and took some of the livestock. And so now he's blaming other people for him not obeying. Now, granted, I'm sure that they'll have to answer for that on judgment too. But the point is, Saul could have stopped it. Saul could have absolutely put a stop to it. If It sounds like another one of those things, just like when he offered the sacrifice too early, when everybody else was saying, Saul, you got to go ahead and give the sacrifice. We're getting restless. We're getting tired. See, this is a recurring problem in Saul's life. Whenever you ask people what is Saul's big mistake, a lot of people will cite jealousy or pride, and those are definitely in there. Don't get me wrong. But I think a lot of Saul's problem is he just cares way too much what other people think. He cared about it when he offered the sacrifice early, even though he knew that he shouldn't have. He cares about it here where a lot of people are kind of just talking him into disobeying God because, well, you know, they really wanted to keep the livestock. And they said, oh, you know, it's such a shame to ruin such great livestock and, and just let all this stuff go to waste. And so they kind of talked him into and coaxed him into doing it. That's not a leader. And we see later that his jealousy spurs up because... All of the other people are saying that David killed tens of thousands and he only killed thousands. See, Saul cares way too much what other people think about him. And it led him down a path of destruction. This is the thing that we have to be so careful of is because if we're constantly worried about what the world thinks about us, and this is especially dangerous in our, world, or in our social media world that we live in right now, if we get hung up on what everybody thinks about us and, and we're just constantly obsessed with other people's opinions of us, that is going to lead us down a path of destruction. And that's exactly what it did with Saul. He was so concerned with pleasing everybody and making sure everybody liked him and thought he was a good king that he was willing to disobey a direct command from God's mouth in order to appease the people. He was concerned with men's opinion of him more than God's opinion, and that's where he messed up. And that really does show a contrast between him and David. There are several occasions in the life of David where David is given the opportunity to do something that would undoubtedly please the people and everybody in, the, in his army would agree with, but God wouldn't. And that's where David goes, nope, got to go with God. Saul goes, eh, I'll go with the people. That's the difference in these two. You see, leadership is a very, very heavy burden. But God is reasonable. When people did essentially the same thing under Moses' command, God didn't blame Moses. Why? Because Moses didn't know about it. Moses did everything he was supposed to. He conveyed the message he said to all the people, no, no, you don't take any spoil from these people. You don't take their gods. You don't take their idols. You leave it. Then he had a guy that did. God didn't blame Moses, because that wasn't Moses' fault. Moses did what he was supposed to do. God does not blame you for the sins of other people. But if you are in a leadership position, and you allow something to go on, then all of a sudden God has something to say about it. See, God only judges a person based on their individual choices, but that which you condone, especially when you're in a leadership position, that is one of your choices. Saul had the option of stopping this in its tracks. If, if the exact same thing had happened and Saul didn't know about it, he told them, no, destroy everything, go ahead, get rid of it, kill Agag the king and, and everything else, and then they just saved it anyway, that wouldn't have been Saul's fault. 
But God could see into his heart. He knew that Saul was the one that gave them permission to do that. He knew that he was the one that orchestrated this whole thing because he wanted to please men rather than God. And that's a trap that we can find ourselves in because if we are in a leadership position, we have to be aware of the fact. If we're in any position of influence at all, whether it's in our family, as a, a parent, as an elder in the church, as a minister, as somebody that, that has a platform where other people will listen, even just as a friend, if we're in a position of influence, we have a responsibility to obey God's command and to make sure we are using that influence in the correct way. Because that is something we will have to answer for. Stay the course, friends. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them. I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.